Welcome, Accounting Boffins, you with Ashraf Patel and the team. We are doing a section called VAT, Value Added Tax. The acronym is VAT. It stands for Value Added Tax. Okay, now, what is it that we need to know about VAT? Remember we said that, think about this, when you go and buy something, the item that you are buying, because you are the end user, you are going to be paying the VAT on that item. So therefore, you are indirectly paying VAT on some goods and services, right? So as a consumer, as an end user, and that is why we say accounting is a life skill. So you know exactly when you're walking into a shop to buy something for yourself, you will be able to know what amount of VAT you've paid. Your till slip will indicate the amount of VAT that was charged on that good or that service. Okay, so now, let's look at a broader picture of VAT. What goes into VAT? What is it that you, you, you should know about VAT? Firstly, your rate of VAT, which is currently, obviously, 15%. Right? Then you get VAT, obviously, on goods and services. You get some items that are zero rated. You get some items that are VAT exempt. Now, there's a distinct difference between VAT exempt and zero rated. But more about that just now. Then obviously, you're going to get a VAT control, which deals with input VAT, that's the amount of VAT that you, as a VAT vendor, has paid, right? And you're going to get output VAT. That's the amount of VAT that you, as a VAT vendor, has collected. And obviously, that will feed in to your VAT control account, which will determine whether you owe SARS or SARS owes you. Right, so that's a, 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 just a concept map for you in terms of VAT. What are the key concepts that you need to know? The question is, why does the South African government levy taxes? Why do we have to pay taxes? As citizens, why must we pay taxes? Obviously, the government is responsible to ensure that the country has efficient roads, hospitals, schools, law and order, welfare services, and many more. So therefore, what happens is taxes are charged to all citizens and businesses in the country in order to provide us with an efficient network of services. The tax money that is collected by the government is used for the country. For example, education, our police force, defense, hospitals, roads, emergency situations. So therefore, if SARS is defrauded, it means that they will not collect all the monies that, and this will obviously then impact on the government's delivery of services. And that is why it's important for you as Joe Citizen to ensure that you pay your taxes. Now there are different types of taxes that we are subjected to. And let's go through each one of them so that we understand exactly what are the taxes that we pay. Obviously, this is company tax, which is levied, levied on all companies in South Africa, right? Then you get personal income tax. Everyone that earns a salary of more than 40,000 per year, obviously this figure is adjusted from time to time. You're not expected to know that figure. What you're expected to know is that every person who earns a salary, obviously the amount will determine, which is determined at government level, for which, which is the minimum amount before you start paying the taxes, you will see if you need that figure, you actually go into the tax tables and you will find it. And like I say, it's adjusted on an annual basis. Right, so if you fall in the category of 
paying taxes, then obviously you're going to have to have to pay your pay P A Y E. It's called P pay as you earn, and that's the amount that you will pay from your personal income towards SARS. Then you get import taxes. Self-explanatory, if you're importing certain items, then there are taxes that are attracted by those items. So when you buy something abroad and you come through with it, obviously you have to pay taxes. If you're in importing and you're importing a product to be sold in South Africa, you're going to pay paying import taxes. All of these, we know, are incomes for SARS. Then you have excise duties levied on certain items that the government wishes to restrict, for example, cigarettes, alcohol, and sugar. So these are, they want to limit the usage, and therefore you have, which we sometimes refer to as a penalty tax. That means you're paying taxes on items such as uh, cigarettes, alcohol, and sugar, etc. Okay, then you also get a fuel levy, right? This one is very, is very it's interesting to read about it, and one of the things I would implore you to do is read about the fuel levy and find out how much does the government charge on fuel also to raise funds, and you will be surprised to find out what the amount of the fuel levy actually amounts to. So a bit of homework for you here, do some reading on the fuel levy. Then you get estate duties. It's levied on the value of a person's wealth when they die, right? That amount also forms part of the, of the coffers. It, fit, it filters into the coffers of SARS as part of their income. Then you get transfer duties. It's levied on the purchase price of a house or a building. That fee also is adjusted from time to time. Once a, the value of a property is above a certain amount, you have to pay a transfer duty, which is also a tax that is levied by the state. Okay, now you come to VAT, which is value added tax. And obviously that's the section that we will be doing. It's paid by everyone when buying or selling on cash or credit, right? So clearly you can see the transaction that you are involved in would attract VAT. Obviously there are certain exclusions, but more about that just now. So in terms of what we've done for VAT so far, we find the following. Let's recap what we've done in this segment. One, the rate of VAT in terms of our percentage is 15%. This figure also is adjusted when the Minister of Finance delivers his budget speech. Sometimes you find that the VAT rate increases. It used to be 14%, and now it is standing at 15%. Okay, VAT is applicable to some goods and services. I'm saying some because obviously there are exclusions. What are the exclusions? You get zero rated items, you get VAT exempt items, most important for you to remember is that input VAT is the VAT that you pay and you claim back from SARS. Output VAT is the VAT that you collect and you pay over to SARS. So very important, keep this in mind, that you as a VAT vendor, you act as an agent on behalf of the state. So you pay your VAT, which you claim back from SARS, and you collect VAT, which you pay over to SARS. So your input, output VAT, eventually feeds in to your VAT control account, and this account will tell you whether you, as a business, owe SARS money, or SARS, as the government, owes you money, depending on whatever happens in your VAT control account. Okay, guys, that's it for this segment. Let's take a quick breather. We'll be back in a jiffy. Welcome back, accounting boffins. 
We're busy with that, value added tax. A quick recap. Remember we said the current rate of VAT is 15%, right? We said that VAT is levied on goods and services. We said you have zero rated items. You have certain exemptions on VAT. We said input VAT is a VAT that we pay as a VAT vendor, which we can claim back from SARS. And then you have output VAT, which is a VAT that we collect and we pay over to SARS. These two items fit into your VAT control account, which will either end off with a, either a debit balance or a credit balance. Right, but obviously more about that later. For now, just remember that your VAT control account actually indicates to you the amount that either you owe SARS or SARS owes you. Okay, now we said that VAT is levied on goods and services in our country, right? We said that VAT is paid on the supply of goods and services. That means if you are a VAT vendor and if you're buying goods, you're going to be paying that VAT, right? The business are obliged to charge VAT on behalf of SARS, and that's an important point. You are, when you're selling the good or the service or providing the service, you're going to charge VAT on that sale. That VAT that you are collecting, you are collected on behalf of SARS and will have to be paid over to SARS. Keep that in mind. So once you pay, th that amount we said will have to be paid over to SARS, that is charged on taxable goods and services. Okay, you will see therefore that since 1991, when VAT was introduced in South Africa, right? Obviously, it's an act of parliament, and therefore, it is something that we have to comply with. Any person who runs a business with a turnover greater than a certain amount, which is, you'll notice, also adapted and changed from time to time, within, within a period of 12 months, must register as a vendor. So you will see now, we, we, you, once you register, you call a VAT vendor. Okay, and if you're a VAT vendor, then you are registered with SARS. Obviously, the acronym SARS stands for South African Revenue Services. You'll find that certain items are exempt from VAT. We said they are exempt from VAT. Now, what are these items? The category would be financial services, interest, life insurances, medical and pension funds, bus, train and taxi passenger fares. All of these are VAT exempt, meaning they will never ever be subjected to VAT. So keep that in mind. When we say they're VAT exempt, it means that they will never ever be subjected to VAT. Okay, then you get, uh, still dealing with exempt items, it's education services, the renting of accommodation for use as a private home, salaries and wages. All of these fall within the category of VAT exempt. That means there's no VAT that's levied on those transactions. That's what we mean by the concept of VAT exempt. Then you have other items which would be hobbies and private recreational pursuits, private sale of personal or domestic items, the supply of goods and services by welfare organizations. All of these fall within the category of VAT exempt. Okay. Continuing, we're saying that generally your goods and services that are not exempt from VAT will have a standard rate. And we all know that the standard rate is 15%. Now, you get items that fall within the category of zero rated. So if an item is either zero rated, zero rated, and I think this is important for you to remember, zero rated means that the item has VAT attached to it, but the rate 
at which it is being charged on that item is 0%. In other words, no VAT. But there's a distinct difference between zero rated and exempt. Okay, so zero rated has VAT charged to it, but the rate is 0%. That's why we say zero rated. The second one is VAT exempt items. Those are items that will never ever have VAT in that particular transaction. So we said the current standard rate is 15%. Obviously, that is determined by the Minister of Finance, and that is the amount that can go up or down depending on the needs of the country. Okay, now we come to items or services, goods and services, that are zero rated for VAT. This would include essential items, and this list also can be changed and updated depending on the needs of the country, right? So currently, what you would find on your zero rated list would be brown bread, eggs, maize meal, beans, fruit and vegetables, paraffin, sardines in a tin, cooking oil, rice, milk products. Basic items that, use, that are used by consumers that are zero rated, meaning there's no VAT, that means there is VAT charge, let's just clarify this point, there is VAT charge, but the rate at which it's charged is 0%, which effectively means there's no VAT. Right, so now, have this uh, concept clear in your minds. You got your exempted items, which will never ever have VAT attached to them, and then you get your zero rated items, and these are your items where the VAT rate is at 0%. Okay, clearly understood. Right. Now obviously, when you commit fraud, it means that there is tax evasion, and at this point, allow me to explain the difference between tax avoidance, right? That's one concept. And tax evasion. Okay. Let's look at tax avoidance first. Tax avoidance is perfectly legal. What do we mean by tax avoidance? By tax avoidance, we mean that you, as a consumer, as a taxpayer, you are allowed to claim back certain items, which will reduce your taxation that you have to pay over to, to SARS, and that is what are items that are accepted by SARS for you to claim back against them, and that's what we refer to as tax avoidance. Perfectly legal, no problems. However, tax evasion is where you are supposed to pay over to SARS and you evade the tax. That means you don't pay it. Clearly, that is illegal. It falls within the category of fraud, right? And is definitely punishable in terms of the laws of the country. So once again, tax avoidance, legal, it's legal means whereby you reduce the amount that you have to pay over to SARS, but tax evasion, illegal, and definitely you'd be committing fraud. When we commit fraud, which is called tax evasion or tax fraud, tax evasion occurred when you do not pay your tax that is due, or when you claim a refund that you are not entitled to, right? or when you're assisting somebody else in committing fraud. So watch, if you do not pay over, or you claim back a refund which you were not entitled to, or if you are party to a transaction where you are assisting somebody not having to pay the necessary taxes over to the state, all of that would be fraud, and like I said, punishable in terms of the laws of our country. Okay, now, if you look at payment of VAT, some businesses have to pay VAT over to SARS on a monthly basis, right? So those businesses that, that have a turnover of more than 30 million per year, right, 
can do a monthly return to SARS. That means at the end of the one month, they determine whether the amount is due to SARS or due from SARS. That means they do a monthly return. Then you get bi-monthly every second month, any business whose sales is 30 million and less per year, this is the norm. Basically, in most businesses you would find that they do a bi-monthly return. That means every second month they do a return to SARS whereby they then, because remember, you have to submit your figures to SARS proving how come you have arrived at a certain figure which is due to them or due to you, right? So that, that, that period is called, that the second one that we deal with here is your bi-monthly or your every second month uh, return. Then you get a six-monthly return, right? And these are farmers with sales of one million and less per year, and they normally do it at the end of February and end of August, right? They do a six-monthly return depending on the needs of that particular sector of the economy. In this case, we're looking at farmers. Right. As a vet vendor, you now have a choice. When you are doing your return, you can either use what we call the invoice basis or the receipt basis. That means, if you Generally, the rule is every business will have what we call the invoice basis is the norm, is the one that is normally used where a transaction is recorded at the time of the invoice. So when the invoice is issued, that's when the VAT is recorded. Okay. Meaning you're submitting your returns based on the invoice basis. However, you will get some businesses where you, but this you'll have to apply for, where it will then be based on receipt basis. That means you will only record the VAT when the monies are actually paid and received. But like I said, for our intents and purposes and for our curriculum purposes, you will only be expected to know the invoice basis of VAT. This is what we mean by the invoice based. It means that the VAT is charged to customers and is due to SARS when the invoice is issued to the customer. Can you see that? The difference is the moment the transaction takes place, in other words, that's the time when the, when the VAT is charged to the consumer and it is then due to SARS. The VAT is paid to SARS before the money is collected from the customer. So although you had a credit transaction, you are liable to pay SARS, although you as a business, you haven't received the money from your customer as yet. The invoice base is the norm, and unless you request for the other option, the invoice basis will automatically apply when you register as a VAT trader. Important. So if you register as a VAT vendor, immediately you know you are going to have to use the invoice basis. If you do not want to use the invoice basis, you have to apply in writing to SARS, explaining why and giving reasons why you want to opt for the receipt basis. If you look at your receipt-based uh, transaction, it means that the VAT is only paid over to SARS when you receive payment, either in full or in part. So very obvious, a receipt basis means you only pay over the amount to SARS when you receive full or part payment of the funds. Right? VAT is recorded against all sales. Any VAT that a business charges on the sale of trading stock and the delivery of services is called output VAT. In other words, we said input VAT is a VAT that you pay and you claim back from SARS, whereas output VAT is a VAT that you collect and you pay over to SARS. Okay, so keep these concepts in mind, input VAT and your output VAT. Remember we said the rate or the standard rate is currently 15%. It's controlled by the government and can be adjusted by the Minister of Finance 
at any time. Whenever the minister re reviews the economy of the country and feels that the VAT needs to be adjusted, obviously that would be the prerogative of the government. Remember what we said? Zero rated. The percentage VAT is zero percent. This year, the minister can decide to change the, the VAT rate at any time. So in other words, if an item falls within the zero rated category, there could be a situation where the economy of the country improves to such an extent that certain items may now become vetable. So those items that are currently zero rated, it can change. Or if the conditions in the economy worsen, more items could be added to the basket of zero rated items. And then obviously your VAT exempt items are those items that will never ever have VAT attached to that transaction. We've discussed that in detail already. Okay? So what we said, exempted and from VAT are those items where no VAT on these goods and services at any time. Right? So your VAT exempt items means they are there, they will never ever have VAT attached to that particular transaction. Okay, so that's it for this segment, guys. We've done a lot of theory. So make sure you understand this theory. When you come back, we'll continue with the section on VAT. Let's take a quick break, and we'll see you in a jiffy. Welcome back, accounting boffins. Remember, we're busy with VAT. A quick recap, we said that we have a standard rate of VAT, which we know is 15%. We also know that we said 15% for our standard rate. We said that we're going to explain, obviously, the input VAT and the output VAT in more detail. Okay, so now, when we say Input VAT. That's the amount paid to SARS for the amount of, for the amount that we have to, has to be refunded by SARS, and that is what we're going to be dealing with now. So, two things: you've paid VAT, and you've collected VAT. So, to make it very simple for you, you've paid VAT, input VAT. You've collected VAT, output VAT. Okay, you got it. Clear. Now, the difference between the two will determine whether you have to pay to SARS or SARS has to pay to you. So if we take this a bit further, we find that our VAT is now divided into two categories, right? The VAT input, like we said, is all the VAT that we have paid on all the items that we have purchased and we've paid VAT, that's the VAT that we can claim back from SARS. Then the output VAT is all the VAT that we have charged customers. In other words, we've collected on behalf of SARS. That amount will then be the amount that we owe to SARS. We'll bring back, we'll reconcile the two figures. That means your input and your output. And this will then tell you the, the answer that we're looking for, whether we're owing SARS or they're owing us. Input VAT. VAT is recorded against most purchases, any VAT that a business pays on the purchase of goods and or service is called input VAT. That gives you now a clear understanding of what input VAT is all about. Output VAT. VAT is recorded against most sales, any VAT that a business receives on the sale of goods and services is called output VAT, right? So that gives you now a clear understanding. Input VAT, all the VAT that you've paid. Output VAT, all the VAT that you have collected. Okay, now, how do you, pay your, how do you make your payments to SARS? A VAT 201 return has to be submitted on or before the 25th of the month after the tax period. The purpose of this form is to disclose 
the amount of output VAT that was charged and the amount that the vendor is entitled to claim back as input VAT. So in other words, this is a form that you fill in, the 201, the VAT 201 form indicating all the VAT that, you've, that you can claim back, all the VAT that you have collected. How do you do your calculation? VAT is collected by the business. The business is required to pay the amount collected over to SARS after deducting the VAT on purchases. Remember the difference between your input and your output VAT. So here's an example for you. If you have an output VAT of 140 Rand, meaning you have collected 140 Rand worth of VAT, and you've paid 84 Rand in, in input VAT, which you can claim back, the difference is the 56 Rand, which will have to be paid over to SARS. The difference indicates the amount that will be paid to SARS or by SARS. In this case here, because your output is greater than your input, it means you have collected more than what you can claim back. You owe SARS, uh, in this case here, 56 rand. But remember, you can have a situation where your input is greater than your output. It can happen. Think about it. A business just starts trading and they buy all their goods and services, but they haven't opened as yet. They've just bought and paid for services. Yes, at that point, they can claim back from SARS because they have started. They haven't started trading as yet, but yet they have bought goods and services on which they have paid the necessary VAT. Okay, now we come to inclusive and exclusive. What are we talking about here? Basically, when you're dealing with the price of an item, you say it either includes the VAT or it excludes the VAT. Now, there are certain uh, permutations that you must know when you're doing VAT calculations. Inclusive means that the amount of VAT is included in the price. In other words, 100% would be your exclusive, your VAT would be at 15%, the total would be 115%. So if you see the word inclusive, it means that the VAT is included in the total price. That's what we mean by the word inclusive. Okay. Exclusive means that the amount is without the VAT at 15%. In other words, it's the 100%. So remember, exclusive is the 100, the VAT is at 15, and inclusive would be 115, where it's 100 plus the 15. So that will give you a clear indication of how to go about doing your calculations. So, if the exclusive is given to you, it will be 100%. If the VAT is given to you, it will be the 15%. If the inclusive is given to you, it will be the 115%. So keep this in mind, 100% exclusive, VAT 15%, inclusive 115. So therefore, you can clearly see that depending on what information is given to you, you will then have to use that information to either determine what the question is asking for. So here we go. They're telling you that the inclusive price is 230, right? You are expected to work out what is the exclusive price. So watch, you take 100, which is your exclusive, over your inclusive, which is 115, and you find that the item actually cost, the normal price was the 200, the VAT was uh, the 30 Rand, and therefore the inclusive price was 230. Clearly you can see, depending on what information is provided to you. Watch this here. You are told that the VAT amount to 15% was given. That means, the 45 rand was the VAT amount, okay? So that was your 15%. Over 100 divided by the 15. Can you see? You're dividing by your known. Your known is 15%. Therefore, the transaction value or the cost price would be the 300 rand. Clearly, you can see 300 rand. If you take 
uh, your, your percentages and you work out 300 times 15, you're going to get a figure of 45 Rand. So what is important in terms of your calculations, know when you are given the 100, know when you are given the 115, know when you are given the 15. So here we go. If the exclusive price is 1,000 Rand, your markup is 200%. The first thing that you determine is your selling price, which will be 1,000. Mark it up by 200% will give you a selling price of 3,000. That's your normal selling price, excluding the VAT. Keep that in mind. Then you bring in the VAT at 15%, right? And that will give you the 150. And then, obviously, that means that your output will be dependent on your sales figure. Watch, there's your 3,000 times the 15%, which will give you your 450. So, on the 1,000 Rand, on that amount there, you've paid that of 150 Rand. But then you took those goods, you marked it up, you sold it at 3,000 Rand, and you collected that from your consumer, at, from the end user at 450. So clearly you can see what amount you've collected 450 from the consumer or the end user. You subtract the amount that you have paid and that's the amount that's due to SARS. Please make sure you understand what I've done here. On the 1,000 Rand that you've purchased, you've paid that at 15%, which was the amount of 150 right? You marked up those goods by 200%. It means you sold it. You added value to it. You sold those goods at 3,000 Rand. But the consumer or the end user now paid you the amount of 450 Rand, which was the VAT on the 3,000. So clearly you can see you've collected 450 from the consumer. You have paid 150 when you bought the original goods. So output 450 Input 150, what do we owe to SARS? The difference, which is the 300 Rand. Let's go through the question. It says here, briefly explain what is meant by value at a tax. It means a tax of 15% is charged by a vendor on the supply of goods and services. It is a tax that is charged by the vendor on the supply of goods and services. Services. So basically, a tax. What is that? A tax that is levied by the VAT vendor. And remember, the VAT vendor acts on behalf of the government. What is the current VAT rate? Simple, 15%. What's the difference between input VAT and output VAT? Remember, we've discussed all of these. So these answers, the, the, these answers you, should be, you, should be, you should be able to give them to me, to me before I give them to you, because we've discussed this in our lesson today. Here goes. VAT input, it represents the amount of tax paid on the purchase of trading stock, consumables, items, and vatable expenses, right? Because remember, you're going to get some items that are not vatable. And again, here's some homework for you. Go and do some research to find out which expenses you can claim VAT on, which expenses you can't claim VAT, back the VAT on, right? For example, if you spend or you pay VAT on entertainment expenses, you cannot claim back that VAT from SARS. Okay, but that's homework for you to draw up a list of items where you can claim back VAT and items that you cannot claim back VAT on. Right? VAT output. What do we know? It's VAT output. This represents the amount of tax collected on the sale of goods and services rendered. In other words, whenever we sell the goods, remember we're the VAT vendor. We, when we sell those goods, the VAT that we collect, that will be my VAT output. You are a registered VAT vendor. You regularly purchase goods from shady furnishers. The owner of Shady Furnishes offers you goods that would normally cost you 6,900, including VAT, at a special price of 5,700, provided that you pay cash and do not require any documentation. Right. Who are we dealing with? Shady Furnishes. The name tells you something. Okay. 
What concerns would you have regarding the non-payment of VAT? Clearly, the non-payment of VAT is regarded as theft. Theft is unethical, and this is an unethical practice. So yes, you can see the ethics component coming into our accounting work, where I told you accounting is a life skill. It teaches you ethics to do the right thing, even though nobody is watching you. You must be ethical in your dealings. So obviously, this is unethical because you, you actually uh, have creating a situation where you, there's no VAT being recorded. And in this way, the government, you're actually stealing from the government. There's no other way of putting it. To be blunt, you are stealing government resources. Would you accept the offer? Explain briefly. Obviously not. Tax evasion is unlawful. It is a criminal offense and punishable by law. The customer and the vendor would face legal consequences. Remember, if you involve yourselves in such transactions, obviously the reputation of the firm also is important. But more important, this is unethical. It is tax evasion, which we know is punishable by the law and both the customer and the vet vendor will be held responsible. Okay, coming back to our concept map, let's look at what we have here. Remember what we said? We said that in terms of all the concepts that you need to know about VAT, number one, recap, our rate is at 15%, right? The goods and services that we have here are all subjected to VAT with the exception of zero rated items. Okay, let's go through zero rated items. What do we know about zero rated items? Zero rated items are those items, and we gave you examples of them before. One that I can just think of is milk, bread, beans, etc. Those items have a VAT rate attached to them of 0%. Remember, at any time, you can either add to that basket or you can remove from that basket. So it doesn't mean that for now, if, 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 if the eggs are zero rated, that they can't be then subjected to the standard rate of 15%. If the minister feels the economy has improved to such an extent that eggs will no longer be seen as a necessary item to be in that basket, it could be removed. Or, we said, if the economy weakens, and we feel we need to add more items that will be subjected to zero rated to assist the poor in our communities and in our, in, a, in, our, in our country, then clearly you can see that that is one that can change from time to time. However, your exempted items, right? Remember, those are items which will never ever have VAT attached to their transactions. School fees, uh, rent for personal uh, uh, property, et cetera, et cetera. We've dealt with items in detail. Once again, you can go through the list to make sure that you're okay with it, which items fall in the exempt category. Now, remember, a very important one here is your fuel. Fuel is not subjected to VAT. The reason, because fuel has its own levy. And that one, I told you, remember, I, I told you earlier in the lesson, I said, do some homework and find out what exactly is the fuel levy and what it amounts to. You'll be very, very surprised to find out the amount that goes into the fuel levy. Right, then we said input VAT. We discussed input VAT in detail, right? What do we know about input VAT? Input VAT is all the VAT that we as a VAT vendor have paid for goods. Can you remember the example that we had? Let's just go through the example one more time so we can clearly explain to you what we are referring to here. Here, here, this is the one I'm looking for. Let me just change the color for us. So we, we said that when we as a consumer, as, as a vet vendor, when we bought the goods, we paid a thousand rand for those goods. So a thousand rand, the vet on that thousand rand is the vet input that we as the VAT vendor have paid. How much VAT did we pay on that amount? We paid an amount of 150 Rand. Right, so remember, it's based on that 
thousand rand there. Okay, then we then marked up those goods by 200%. That was our markup policy. And we sold those goods at 3,000 rand. Now watch, when we sold those goods at 3,000 rand, how much VAT did we collect? We collected an amount of 450 rand. Clear? Remember, I'm doing this as revision. On the current lesson that we are doing, I'm revising the input and the output so that you have a clear understanding of input and output. So here you can see. Right, now, what amount is due to SARS? Clearly you can see you've paid 150 Rand as your input. You're collecting from the end user 450 Rand. Do you have to pay SARS the entire 450? No. Why not? Because you've collected the 450, but you have input, you have paid 150 Rand worth of VAT on that transaction. Therefore, the amount that is due to SARS will only be the 300 Rand. So now, the difference between your input VAT and your output VAT is now what is, it either shows you whether you owe SARS money or whether they owe you money. Right? So keep this in mind, that your input VAT and your output VAT would flow into an account called the VAT control account. And this VAT control account will then indicate to you whether it is an asset or a liability. What am I saying? I'm saying that it can either have a debit balance or it can have a credit balance. So in this way, you will see whether the amount is due to SARS or due from SARS. Okay guys, what we've done is we've given you an in-depth lesson on VAT with the theory and the calculations. Make sure that you remember the known figure, whether you are given the 100%, whether you're given the 15%, or whether you're given the 115%. The inclusive, exclusive, and the VAT amount. Okay, so make sure that you are able to master the section on VAT. From me, Ashraf Patel and the team, keep your feet on the ground, reach for the stars, and be good. Goodbye.